Hi, we continue in 2 Samuel 2 today and complete the chapter after Abner has reluctantly killed Asahel and now is being pursued by his brothers, Joab and Abishai, that is to say Asahel's brothers. And what we've been seeing is how personal this conflict has been. It was personal between David and Saul in 1 Samuel, but it was personal there around the question of the, the Yahweh's anointed. Uh, David never really made it about Saul personally. He made it about Saul holding the office of Yahweh's anointed and said he would never harm Yahweh's anointed, of course, seeking to protect himself when he took up that same position. And at least he's partially taken up that same position, having been anointed as king over Judah so far. But once he sent messengers to Jabesh Gilead to see if they would go along with this, he's been out of the picture, and it's really been up to the generals, Joab and Abner. And immediately, as we saw, it was made personal in the last scene uh, where uh, Joab said to the running Asahel, how would I face your brother Joab if I have to strike you down? But that's what's happened and now here they come. And so uh, to set ourselves up, if you haven't watched the introductory video for this uh, section of 2 Samuel 2, 1 to 5, 5, the section you can see at the top of the right side of the screen, I really encourage you to do that. It has some cover some issues that are important to understand how this fits in with the bigger picture. But for now, let's just see where we are. We're at this point in the story here at the end of chapter 2. And as you can see, ironically, even though a temporary peace is reached, the very next verse says there's a war. But it's a war between the houses at that point. It'll change its character. Uh, we've also been noting the links between this unit, 2, 1 to 5, 5, and 2 Samuel 15 to 19. In particular today, it's going to be around the role of the Benjaminites. We've seen already the sons of Zariah, which is, say, Asahel, Joab, and Abishai. And we've seen Hebron, and we'll see Hebron again today. And we've seen Mahanim, and we'll see Mahanim again today. We won't get to these parts until uh, chapter 3 and chapter 4. Um, so we also are looking at, at the key words, and we're looking at the final paragraph here. And the Hebrew hare, which we've seen so many times in this chapter, the going after, after, is so many times here because it's a pursuit story, and that shouldn't surprise us. Uh, and we'll look at another structural element in addition to the key words here in, in uh, just a second. In fact, why don't we do that now? This section, starting from the second half of verse 23, where Asahel had fallen, up through the end of the chapter, forms kind of a loose chiasm. I'll put it up here on the screen so you can see it. Uh, it's not that tight, but the frame is, as you can see, that begins with Asahel fallen and Joab and Abishai pursuing Abner and the sun going down on the way to the wilderness of Gibeon. And at the other end, Asahel is taken up and buried. Joab returns from pursuing Abner and day broke. And then the middle parts are not exactly as parallel, but we see in the B part on verse 25, the Benjaminites rally around Abner and take their stand. And on the flip side in verse 29, Abner and his men uh, return to Mahanim. That's not exactly a parallel. It's certainly a parallel between the leader and the people, but it's not as parallel as we'll see in the little chiasm that takes up verses 29 to 32, which is much more symmetrical. But at the center here, and clearly it is the center, is verses 26 to 28, where Abner and Joab collectively call for peace. And there is a peace, and everybody goes back to their starting points. Uh, and that's what we'll see in our passage today. Uh, so as we begin to look uh, at our passage, we'll see there's some places we don't know, but also some very familiar places. And as we were looking in the beginning of chapter 2, there were many echoes of Genesis that we saw as Mahanim um, is the place where Jacob had a powerful experience. And we've also seen Hebron, where Abraham first settled and where Sarah died. But in this section, we're going to see some Exodus um, echoes, especially the crossing of the Jordan, uh, but more than that as we go. Uh, so it's interesting, I think, as the authors are uh, asking readers to listen back to previous stories, if they are, in fact, previous stories. And it's certainly my take that Exodus is written as a counter story to the succession story, the story of succeeding not just Solomon succeeding David, but Rehoboam or Jeroboam succeeding Solomon and the division into two places. And um, the, the story of Exodus is a symbolic story of rebelling from the Solomonic rulership in Jerusalem. We'll get there when we get there. Um, so uh, for now, let's just enter into our passage. So Job and Abishai pursue Abner, and there's no break here. Asahel had fallen, and apparently a bunch of people came and stood there, so we don't know how long that take, but now they're chasing after Abner. And we hear the sun was going down, uh, which is to say they're going to be doing this at night. Um, 
we've not seen Shemesh, son, in 1 Samuel. We'll see it here, and we'll see it in the next chapter, uh, and we'll see it crucially in chapter 12 when Nathan, in the name of Yahweh, upbraids David for uh, what he did with Bathsheba's husband Uriah, not to mention what he did with Bathsheba. So we'll see some uh, anticipatory echoes ahead. So as the sun was going down, they came to the hill of Amma, which lies before Gia, on the way to the wilderness of Gibeon. And the fact is, nobody has any idea of where these places are. Amma is the Hebrew for mother, so it could perhaps mean mother city or mother hill, something like that. Uh, but we just have no idea where that is. But the wilderness of Gibeon is certainly the area out here, and we'll look uh, at some Google Maps to see this up closely as we go. So. Uh, they're taking the, they started here around the pool, of course, and we don't know exactly where, uh, where this pursuit ended, where Asahel fell. And we don't know where these places are, so all we know is we're out here somewhere. Remembering uh, that the David people started in Hebron down here, and the Abner people started in Mahanim up here and met here. And that's where they'll return before the chapter's over. So now suddenly the Benjaminites rally around Abner and form a single band. Why draw attention to the Benjaminites here? And to understand that we have to look at the role of the Benjaminites in 2 Samuel. And really we have to go back and look at the Benjaminites uh, in, the, uh, in the Deuteromistic history earlier. And the preface is the terrible long story in Judges 19 to 21, and I won't take the time to go over that now. A war takes place between Israel and Benjamin after a rape of a visitor's woman by the Benjaminites, and that leads the Israelites to refuse to marry Benjaminites after the war is over, and so to continue Benjamin as one of the tribes of Israel within the idea that we see in Judges. We don't see it here in Samuel, but the sense of Benjamin as one of the tribes. Um, they take 400 women from Jabesh Gilead. They have something to do with why David went to Jabesh, Jabesh Gilead at the beginning of the chapter here, and then took more from Shiloh as wives for the Benjaminite men. And I won't comment other than to note that the story seems to have no compunction about stealing these women from these places and providing them for the Benjaminite men. So that put Benjamin in a dark light as the book of Judges ended, and that is the very end of the book of Judges, uh, unless we look at it as I've been suggesting from the beginning of our looking at 2 Samuel and structuring where 2 Samuel is in the whole Deuteronomistic history, unless we see uh, judges through some section of 1 Samuel, as David Jobling has suggested, as extended judges. In other words, at least up until the establishment of Saul as king in 1 Samuel 10. And that's part of the point because Saul, of course, is a Benjaminite. And so let's follow that as we went through 1 Samuel to get up where we are now. So a man from Benjamin ran to the battle line and came to Eli to tell him that his sons uh, had been killed. And we saw how that story was parallel with what we saw at the beginning of 2 Samuel with the man, the Amalekite man coming from the battle, at least alleging he came from the battle. And then we see in 9 1 the man of Benjamin whose name was Kish, who's of course um, Saul's father. And we see that set up there. And then they wander in the territory of Benjamin because that's where Saul is. Uh, and he's made king uh, with the tribe of Benjamin taken by Lot, and finally he's selected from that. Uh, and then we saw later, while Saul is established as king, notice the, the separation here between Israel and Benjamin there without any explanation. Saul takes 3,000 out of Israel, and 2,000 are with Saul, and 1,000 are with Jonathan and Benjamin, which is say, they're not Benjaminites as such. That's a mistake on my part. They're 3,000 from Israel, but they're going in separate places, 1,000 with Jonathan and Gibeah, uh, which is almost certainly the same as Gibeon where we are now with Saul and Mishmash. And then just a little later in the next chapter, we see similarly they went up from Gilgal toward Gibeah of Benjamin, and, uh, and they stay there. Then near the very end, not quite the end of 1 Samuel, um, uh, when Saul feels um, betrayed by them, and that's a suggestion of many scholars that at least a group of these Benjamites have seen that Saul is getting paranoid and is no longer trustworthy and have gone over to David by sending him messages to protect him from Saul. And so when Saul says, is that why you've all conspired against me? He might not just be paranoid. It might be the case uh, that they've conspired against him, but they don't answer there. So that leads us to where we are here. And we saw uh, in the beginning um, that Abner made Ishbal king over these uh, places, including Benjamin as a place. And that's a distinction I didn't note. It's on the, this chart, but I didn't note it, that the, the, blue, the ones that are colored blue here are people, and the ones that are colored green are places. So Benjamin as Benjaminite people, and Benjamin also as a, as a territory. And we're going to see, we see in our immediate scene here, and then following what we saw, we noted from the links between our 
section here and the section in chapters 15 and 19, the Benjaminites are only here and in that section. So it shouldn't surprise us. There's this big leap from seeing them in chapter 4 to all the way in chapter 19. When another one of their members, long after the house of Saul is gone, Shammai, son of Gera, uh, taunts uh, David as king and is threatened to be killed and eventually is killed. Uh, and then finally, near the end, they buried the bones of Saul and his son Jonathan in the land of Benjamin. So we see the Benjamins all the way through, and they're in distinction from the Israelites here. Um, they're the people around Abner, and certainly Abner is representing uh, all those northern territories, the, the ones uh, that we saw noted uh, here in 2.9. In and it, all Israel seems to be the collective reference, but we don't hear about any people coming from any of these places. Only the Benjaminites show up. So let's look further into our passage uh, as we explore uh, this pursuit. So the Benjaminites rallied, uh, using this word that's not pronounceable without, the, without a vowel here, QVTS, Quits here. Uh, and we will see it again in a few more verses, and we'll see it in 321. Um, it can mean simply to gather, as gathering objects. And so we can see that parallel with what we'll see in verse 30, although it's not exactly a chiastic parallel. So the Benjaminites rally around Abner, and presumably that's to protect him, um, because he, it's his life that's at stake. This is not a war at this point, as we can see just in the previous verse, they're pursuing Abner. So they form a wall of protection around Abner, and form what's described here as a single band, but it could also be just one bunch and suggest they're protecting him, and take their stand at the top of a hill. It doesn't say it's the same as the hill of Amma, just some hill. Um, and the taking a stand is, echoes the people who stood still at, at the foot, um, at the uh, death of Asahel there, and we'll see it again in verse 28. So now with the Benjaminites surrounding Abner and Job and Abishai pursuing, and, re and the Job and Abishai certainly recognizing what are they going to do, we don't see that they have a group of troops, although they will, uh, we will be told that, but we only hear right now it's just the two of them pursuing. So from the top of the hill, Abner calls to Joab, something like David calling to Abner back in 1 Samuel 26 in the opposite direction, um, is the sword to keep devouring forever. Um, we hear that in 2 Samuel 11.25 in a terribly ironic way where David uh, uses that line to tell Joab to not worry about the fact that David ordered him to send Bathsheba's husband Uriah to the front of the fighting and to let him get killed there and that Uriah would just be killed amidst the eating of everybody by the sword. Uh, so there is a terribly ironic recollection here. So Abner asks rhetorically, is the sword to keep eating us forever? And the word forever in Nesach here is only in one other place in the entire Pentateuch or Deuteromistic history, although it's 43 times in the Masoretic text. Do you not know that the end will be bitter? And this is one of the, uh, the echoes or memories of the Exodus, Mara, the bitter water, and then in the Passover feast, the bitter herbs that remember the bitter water, as in Exodus 15:23. Uh, but we'll also, we also saw it in 1 Samuel 22, too, where David's men were the embittered men that he gathered. And we'll see it again in 2 Samuel 17, 8 here, uh, when Hushai says, you know your, that your father, which is to say David, and his men are warriors, and they're enraged, um, which is to say they are bitter here. Um, so we'll see that again coming up. So notice the sequence of rhetorical questions, though the ultimately they're asking a real question. Can we just stop now? So is the sword to keep devouring forever? Do you not know that the end will be bitter? How long will it be before you order your people to turn from the pursuit of their kinsmen? Order is too strong here. It's used because he's in a military command situation, but it's simply say. So how long before you say, Joab, to your people to turn from pursuing their brothers? Um, Achahim here, their brothers, uh, emphasizing that this is civil war. Um, this is a family struggle amongst them. And so at the center of the, the chiasm here, Joab responds. Uh, and as Graham Old notes below, does he mean, had you not spoken now, we would have pursued you through the night till morning? Or had you not spoken the way you did this morning, none of this would have happened? It could go either way. So let's listen to what he says. As God lives, notice it's Elohim here, not Yahweh. And that's the only place I can find that, um, that phrase as only Elohim anywhere um, in the Deuteromistic history. In these sections in 1 Kings, it's Yahweh your God lives, and then outside the Deuteromistic history, it's also Yahweh God. Um, 
And so uh, this is the only place. Does that suggest that Joab doesn't know Yahweh? We have no idea what Joab believes about religion or anything. But he's calling it Elohim here um, to make this more serious. So as Elohim lives, if you had not spoken, the people have continued to pursue their kinsmen, not stopping until morning. Emphasizing this is all happening in the dark at night. Um, and they both say pursuing their brothers. So notice there's a great symmetry here uh, between Abner's rhetorical questions and Joab's response. Uh, hence the, the fitting into the chiastic centerpiece. So Joab sounded the trumpet, which is to say the shofar, which you can hear what it sounds like here. It was the loudest contained sound known in the ancient world, and we'll see it again. It was once in 1 Samuel 13, uh, back then at the end of a battle, and uh, we'll see it a few more times. Um, uh, the shofar sounding, the ram's horn, and all the people stopped. Um, they stood just as they stood over the body of Asahel at the beginning, and they no longer pursued Israel or engaged in battle any further. So Joab illustrating his power over them, just simply the sound of the, of the trumpet here is enough. And notice how here it emphasized pursuing Israel. It's not pursuing the men of Abner. It's not pursuing the Benjaminites. Um, it's pursuing Israel, the first time we've heard that uh, mentioned here. Or engaged in battle any further, at least for a few more verses, because in 3.1 we hear the war goes on. So let me scroll down so we can see the rest of, oops, a little too far, the rest of our scene here. And we can note, as you can see on, on my uh, note pane below, that these verses form a nice tight little chiasm with verse 29 with Abner and his men marching all night and verse 32 with Job and his men marching all night, both crossing the Jordan and then the body count on either side. So we can look at the atlas here, but I think it'll help to look at Google Maps to understand what's going on here. Because the writers have taken the trouble to describe this march, this nighttime march, and through the morning. Um, and why do we need to know all this? It's highlighting the distance among, uh, between them, but it's, it, but it's also highlighting the coming together as brothers and then the going apart. Um, so they each go their separate ways simultaneously. So Abner has meant trouble all that night to the Arabah, or the desert plain steppe, as the lexicon suggests, uh, or as Sumora suggests, the Jordan River Rift. But there's another word for that uh, a little farther down. So maybe there are two different words for that. You can see it here on Google Maps. Um, uh, at least you can see it from uh, the north, the northern end of that where they are. It's not all the way up to the Sea of Galilee, of course. Um, but we can see where they cross through the Jordan Valley. And this is the other word here where it says marching. New Revised Standard has the whole forenoon, but Habitron here is only here in the Masoretic Test. So the lexicon has it as the cleft ravine of the Jordan, so which in that case, the Arabah would be the western side of the Jordan, and um, the Habitron would be the eastern side, uh, perhaps. Then they came to Mahanim, and so you can see that here, Mahanim, not on Google Maps, because we don't really know for sure where it is, um, but that they went across that whole uh, distant region. And let's look at the parallel in verse 32 while we're looking at the maps, and then we'll come back to the body count. So the people on the other side took up Asahel, which means they had to go back to that spot. So despite the pursuit and up on the hill of Amma, they had to go back to that spot to get his body. Presumably he was sitting there all this time and buried in the tomb of his father. Interestingly, we never hear his name. We hear these are the sons of Zariah, who's the mother, as I noted in the previous video, but we never hear about who the father is, which was in Bethlehem. And so now you can see the, the Jordan Valley here from Bethlehem all the way back down to Hebron, uh, where they were. Uh, and, of course, Bethlehem is also the, the home of David and the home of Jesse that we saw first back in 1 Samuel 16. So it's suggesting that perhaps the sons of Zariah and, and David and his brothers grew up together. Bethlehem was certainly not a large town at the time, and it would certainly suggest they know each other, and perhaps that's why he's working for them, uh, even though he disclaimed them last scene, and we saw that he claimed he was uh, powerless to stop them because they're too violent for him. Um, so here they are leading uh, the, the parade back. So I realized I finished this video without talking about the Exodus echo of the crossing the Jordan. So I'm inserting these little couple minutes in there to cover that topic, which is important to our scene here. So uh, just like we saw with the issue of Benjamin having its roots in Judges and earlier, here we have crossing the Jordan also having its roots in the Deuteronomistic history in Deuteronomy and Joshua. And so as, you, as my chart on the right side has, crossing the Jordan is 16 times the Deuteronomy. Here's one classic um, 
programmatic example of it from Moses. Hear, O Israel, you are about to cross the Jordan today to go in and dispossess nations larger than mightier than you. So that's the call. And we hear it echoed in Joshua at the very beginning, the first words of Joshua. And note that the phrase is 12 times in Joshua. My servant Moses is dead. Now proceed to cross the Jordan, you and all this people, into the land that I'm giving them to the Israelites. And so that's the background. The crossing the Jordan into the land is following the route out of slavery and into freedom. And crossing the other way, of course, would be crossing into slavery, although that narration is never given in Exodus. They only go the one way out from Egypt. Um, and of course, they're not crossing uh, the Jordan in that place. They're crossing it coming back up from Egypt. Um, so it's a little different situation, but the symbolism is the same. And so we see it, we saw it once in 1 Samuel, some Hebrews crossed the Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead while Saul was still in Gilgal. We see it here, and we'll see it a few more times, especially in the story of Absalom's rebellion. And this is not one of those examples that's only in our current unit and that unit, because we see it here in 1017, but it's certainly concentrated up in the situation we're in now, and then when David leaves and crosses the Jordan to get away from Absalom. And then it'll happen one more time, curiously, at the very end during the controversial census where Joab and the commanders cross the Jordan and count the people all on the other side. So as they cross the Jordan in this symbolic march that both sides are doing simultaneously, we need to hear the echoes of Moses and Joshua doing that with the Israelites once upon a time. Joe and his men, and this is the first thing we hear of his men, as I was noting, we'd only, well, we'd, uh, no, we'd, first time we heard of Job's men, we heard of Abner and his men there, and this makes it parallel for the chiasm. They marched all night, and the day broke upon them in Hebron. Um, so again, both marching all night. And then we hear the body count. So at least according to the narrator, notice they're described as the slaves of David. Every time it says servants, it really means slaves. And notice this is the first time David's mentioning mentioned here in both these situations here. Um, uh, only in the body count. Otherwise, it was Joab and his men. So Joab returned from the pursuit of Abner when he gathered them. There were missing of David's slaves, 19 plus Asahel, so 20. But the servants of David, again, notice the symmetry there, not the men of Joab, had killed of Benjamin, curious way to put that, 360 of Abner's men. Um, it's a very convoluted way of putting that. They're Abner's men, but they're all Benjaminites. But what we'd heard was they stopped fighting against Israel, um, even though it, it seems to be that only the Benjaminites were involved in the war, and this uh, nice symmetrical number of 360 were killed. So if at least we're going by body counts, uh, the, the David side is winning, but as you can already see in the beginning of the next chapter, a long war between the house of Saul and the house of David began. Described here as exactly that, between the house of Saul and the house of David, not between Israel and Judah, but between the these two monarchical houses. So Saul's house is not done yet and David has some more work to do before he'll become king over Israel. Stay tuned for that next time. See you then. Bye-bye.